morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and thank you for joining this webinar, which is titled From Exceptional Cases to Everyday Abuses, Labor Exploitation in the Global Economy. My name is Borislav Gerasimov, and I'm the Communications and Advocacy Coordinator at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women, or YADW. We are an international network of more than 80 NGOs from all regions of the world that advocates for the rights of migrants and trafficked persons. Our members engage in direct assistance to migrants and trafficked persons and campaigns and advocacy at the International Secretariat of the Network and we support our members with research, knowledge sharing and international advocacy. The aim of today's webinar is to present the most recent issue of the Anti-Trafficking Review. The Anti-Trafficking Review is published by GATW and it's the first open access peer-reviewed journal that focuses on human trafficking and its broader and its intersections with broader issues such as gender, migration, labor, and development. The journal publishes two issues per year in April and September. Each issue is devoted to a predetermined topic and guest edited by one or more academics. So the next issue, which we'll publish in April, has the theme of trafficking in minors. And the issue that we'll publish in September of next year is themed anti-trafficking education. But today we are going to uh, present the latest issue whose theme is everyday abuse in the global economy. And the guest editors were Joe Quirk, Caroline Robinson and Cameron Tybos. So with that, I uh, will move to introduce our speakers today from east to west, Benjamin Harkins, Senior Program Manager for the Livelihoods and Food Security Fund Myanmar, Joe Quirk, Professor of Politics at the University of the Witwatersrand, South Africa, Ella Parry Davis, British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at the Royal, School, Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, University of London in the UK, Abigail Hunt, fellow, a Research Fellow at the Overseas Development Institute uh, in the United Kingdom, Bama Atreya, fellow at the Open Society Foundations and, a, and at Just Jobs Network in the US. And Federico Parra, Latin America coordinator of the Way Speaker Program of the NGO Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing in Colombia. Or he is based in Colombia. Thank you everyone for being here. So I want to start with you, Joe. The theme of this special issue is everyday abuse in the global economy. And my first question is, what is everyday abuse and how is it different from human trafficking, forced labor and modern slavery? Thanks um, and welcome everyone from, from all over the world. I, I appreciate that it's uh, a difficult time, but I think there's at least some small byproduct to our current condition where we now get to have everyone from all over the world contributing to this kind of conversation. And, and I think at the risk of kind of promoting the issue, I think it's one of its strengths where we have different experiences and uh, forms of organizing uh, represented here in this special issue. And I think to answer the question, that was kind of what we were looking for. Um, for those of you who've kind of worked on questions of, of associated with modern slavery and human trafficking and forced labor, there's a suspicion that we had, both myself and my colleagues, Caroline and Cameron, that this particular conversation was limited in its scope in that it tended to focus on cases that were regarded as the absolute worst of the worst and thereby constructed in a way that juxtaposed the exceptional with the everyday. And we felt that this focus on exceptional cases was problematic for a number of reasons. We thought firstly, that it missed what was important about the systems which resulted in forms of exploitation and precarity and vulnerability. So, so if you wanna understand better how these things that have come to be called modern slavery and human trafficking arise, you first need to look at the broader regulatory and legal and economic systems within which they're embedded and contextualized. And then secondly, 
we wanted to problematize the idea that there are exceptional cases that stand apart from or above larger forms of labor and migration and work. And, and part of our animating concerns was that this focus on exceptional cases comes with politically problematic agendas and diagnoses, wherein we feel that focusing on the exceptional runs the risk of tacitly deprioritizing and even legitimating the larger systems of, of vulnerability and exploitation which are associated with the operations of the global economy. So when we focus on the everyday, we're interested in, in kind of revealing things that otherwise go unnoticed because they're baked into the smooth and regular operations of how migration and economic systems are organized, designed and operate. And in this special issue, we wanted to kind of excavate these types of experiences and redirect attention so they focus upon the systems that generate both the extreme cases that attract all the attention, but also more specifically on the, the, the larger everyday experiences, which are characteristic of work and migration and the ways in which people live within these systems and then crucially how they organize in opposition to them and what kinds of ways and strategies and lessons might be derived from a broader focus on those types of experiences. Thank you, Joe. So I, I was going to, to ask you why it's important to focus on everyday abuse, but I think you answered this question already. So I will I want to ask you, what are the strategies for addressing everyday abuses versus addressing forced labor, human trafficking and modern slavery? Uh, and of course, this is also what our uh, other speakers will be uh, focusing on today. But uh, if you can share in uh, broader terms. So I'm not going to pretend my answer is an exhaustive one, because inevitably this question is far too big to kind of reduce to a short sound bite. I think for the purposes of this discussion, I would draw a distinction between a heavy concentration on criminal justice as a solution for dealing with extreme cases of exploitation and the problematic aspects that, that tend to arise out of this idea of prosecuting yourself out of structural problems. And I juxtapose that with a focus on migrant and labor rights, forms of collective organizing, and the ways in which people seek to articulate and defend their own interests. And I think this is worth emphasizing, and there's a lot more I could say, but I, I nonetheless want to foreground this because I think there's a danger in constructing this problem as one which is characterized by a need to rescue from the outside. And, and there's huge problems with this in the sense that it generates kind of collateral damages in practice, but it's also animated by an ideal of kind of paternalism where people from the outside know better than the people who are experiencing these things directly. And I think in terms of interventions, it's focusing on how laws are designed, how regulations are structured, and seeking to amplify and extend the voices of people who are knowing their own circumstances best, which I ultimately think needs to be the starting point. So uh, there's lots of things you can do, but before you do those more specific things, it's necessary to reorient how the problem is diagnosed and in doing so to open up a new way of seeing it where instead of help from the outside being your primary mode of intervention, you instead start from the bottom and build up. Yes, I think, um, yeah, also is, it allows for a better look and addressing uh, underlying issues or root causes. Um, uh, if you look at um, through the lens of everyday abuse. Um, now I, I want to start with a topic which I think doesn't receive enough attention by the anti-trafficking community, and that's the digital economy or platform work or also called gig work. Obama, your article focuses on the working conditions and workers agency in platform work. 
Please tell us um, more. Are gig workers the free independent entrepreneurs that platforms claim they are? Thank you very much, Borislav, and, and to Get W for including the piece in Anti-Trafficking Review, and then also for the opportunity to be with this wonderful group of people today. I will let me start actually by you know saying a few things that just may not be obvious to people who have worked on traditional economic sectors, uh, these, these issues in traditional economic sectors, and really picking up on the wonderful framing that uh, Joel just gave us. Um, algorithmic exploitation is everyday abuse. And I know that's a mouthful, so let me explain some things that, uh, you know, again, that may be a little bit new to people who have been largely tracking traditional economic sectors. This is a moment when we really have transitioned from what we were calling a global economy to a digital economy. And data is an incredibly vital resource that drives that. What does that mean for those of us that are concerned with preventing human trafficking? We are used to thinking about the body as, as the locus, right? Uh, the control over the body, the control over the physical actions that the body takes as being the manifestation of forced labor. Um, in reality, now what's happening is that in uh, surveillance capitalism, you're getting the extraction of intimate personal information about each individual. So this is quite new for us to think about. What, what do we think is uh, the right way to approach the possibility that for all of us, but you know, since the piece is focused on workers, let's talk about workers. Once you get on a platform, the company that controls the platform has access to minute levels of personal information about you and can sell that information and that information can be used either by that platform or by others to whom it is sold to engage in very, very sophisticated um, methods of behavioral manipulation and control. And I can talk more about what that looked like for, for some of the um, work that I did. But just on that big picture again, sort of I want people to get their heads around why this is everyday abuse. This is now a widespread phenomenon. This is not sort of an episodic thing. Uh, we have people connected around the world. We have some very, very low wage and precarious workers who are getting gigs through apps and all of their personal data is also available and you know, is being used to manipulate and to control. And so one of the things that I have you know, suggested that we all need to think about is whether labor law is really sufficient to address this or whether we need to think in qualitatively different ways. Um, again, back to Joel's point about structural issues. What kinds of you know, breaks do we need on this practice of extracting people's personal data, that is extracting their selves in a sense, owning that, taking that away from people and owning it, and then using it to sell back to you know, entities that might wanna control and manipulate those individuals. Um, you know, in the world of work, what this looks like uh, on the platforms is that the data is directly used for algorithms, for codes that are programmed to optimize the amount of work that can be extracted from each individual on the platform. And ultimately, the way those codes are written, the ultimate form of optimization is, of course, if the work is provided for free. Now, Given this fiction of sort of self, you know, I mean, there we we can talk about the legal aspects of whether people are self-employed or whether they're they're working for the platform. But any way you slice it, the fiction exists that the individual can say stop at some point and just say I don't want to do this work. The reality of the code, however, is that it is programmed to continue to push people to do work for you know ever less income to complete the same task. It has data about people around the world. It can use that data to sort of pit, you know, really sort of do labor arbitrage on an immense scale. And ultimately that leads to, you know, really profound degradation of work itself. So you've got these two things going on at once. You've got the algorithms being used to degrade and again, engage in labor arbitrage, but you've also got this really profound ethical dilemma of, should they even be allowed to have that personal data in the first place? It is uh, difficult to wrap our heads around these things. Um, 
And I, every, from the from the first time I read your article, the, the submission, I was thinking, you know, uh, this is so um, so terrible. But uh, for for the audience, please share some uh, more specific examples of uh, the forms of coercion, control, and exploitation that platform companies engage in, um, as you discuss in the article, and also you you've done uh, a lot of research in this area. I have uh, focused, I interviewed uh, platform workers in uh, several countries and started off doing, you know, interviews with workers in different types of occupations, different types of gig work. Ended up spending a lot of time with people who were drivers on various ride hailing platforms, Uber, Lyft, Bolt, Ola, Grab, uh, and the like, uh, or Gojek. Um, so, you know, what I ended up doing was uh, really digging deeply into one aspect of platform work and getting some really rich case data from that. Some of that case data is also captured. I used some of these interviews in a podcast called The Gig. Um, intentionally, I mean, it's wonderful to be with all of you and to have the opportunity to theorize these things, but also very important that, um, you know, drivers and, and indeed riders can be able to access um, what workers said, what gig workers said in their own words. And, and the, the podcast is a vehicle to do that. So, so a lot of um, important information there. So getting you know, specifically to your question of what did they face? What were some of the forms of control that they faced? One very significant uh, thing that you know, just about all gig workers face, not just drivers, is a rate, there's a use of a ratings system. And I think many of you who have ever taken a ride hailing, you know, used a ride hailing app may be familiar with this, where you put a one to five star rating into the app to rate your driver. Now, this rating may to you as a rider seem like an innocuous thing, a way of giving a little feedback, but the driver never gets that feedback. Instead, that is an input into this very sophisticated, again, system of algorithmic control that is used uh, to determine whether or not over time, right, that rider get, that driver gets more rides, less rides, more pay, less pay, uh, very sophisticated. And that is not something that the, the clients may realize but um, they are being used to enable this algorithmic control. So that was something drivers faced. Uh, very, you know, sort of commonly told story about how that plays out again in just in individual, you know, sort of experience is that um, they would particularly in the early part of their shift be over time pushed to do longer and longer and longer rides to get to their first pickup. And this happened in multiple countries. This wasn't sort of a thing that was just happening in one location. And you know, clearly what the companies are doing is testing, trying to collect data about just how far they can compel drivers to go before they start refusing rides, before it becomes no longer, you know, you've optimized to zero where it will cost them as much to get there as it will to collect the fare that they're going to get for that ride. So, so that's a really concrete example of exactly how that works in practice. And if, again, if you sort of take that on a global scale, think about the actual uh, revenue that has been extracted from these millions of drivers around the world once you start really sort of you know, adding up what each of those individual experiences comes to. Um, one thing I want to mention that's interesting, because I think it's very interesting for us to talk about, OK, so what, what means do workers have to resist in this context where they are simply, you know, it, we, we've given up uh, the ability to control that extraction of data. And I think a really interesting solution is, again, you know, get outside of labor law and think about what we can do to contest that data extraction. And just earlier this week, a very exciting thing happened, which I, I want to share with everyone. A group um, of gig workers filed suit uh, in the Netherlands under Europe's uh, global data protection regulation to contest exactly this, to contest the very fundamental premise that companies should even be allowed to use that data for that sort of um, behavioral control, particularly when it comes to making decisions, automated decisions about firing, about termination. Thank you, Bama. Um, I, I hope um, the audience realizes that there is a lot of very interesting uh, data in your article, and I encourage everyone to, to read your article. Um, um, I want to turn to Abigail. Uh, the article that you co-authored with Emma Saman also analyzes gig work, but with a focus on 
um, platform for platforms for domestic workers in South Africa. What are the similarities and differences between platform domestic work and the traditional domestic work sector, which is known for um, precarious conditions? Thank you. Um, yeah, just before I start, um, again, thanks to you, Boris Lav, and the editors for doing such a fantastic job bringing together um, this edition. Um, I think there's some brilliant articles in there which will definitely become references for our work. Um, and I'm really pleased to have had the opportunity to be part of it and, of course, to join this great webinar today. So thank you for all your, your tireless efforts over the last year. Um, so in terms of similarities and differences between on-demand uh, uh, domestic work um, via platforms and the traditional, uh, if you like, uh, uh, domestic work sector, I think first and foremost, um, the worker profile is largely similar. That's very clear to us, um, which is not surprising given that many on-demand uh, workers are also active in the traditionally organized sector. So um, in the traditional sector, it's overwhelmingly poor Black African women, um, as defined by Stats South Africa. Um, similarly, in our survey of workers, uh, they were 98% female and 97% Black African, so a pretty clear alignment there. Um, domestic workers on the whole are a relatively young worker cohort. The traditional sector median age um, is 41. Um, platform workers are just slightly younger with a median age of 35 in our survey. But all that to say that the workers um, are largely the same group. Um, I think another major similarity which I really wanted to draw attention to today is that of insufficient earnings. Um, and I think this stems from the underpinning um, undervaluation of domestic work across both forms of work. Um, and it's been long documented that unpaid uh, domestic work, mostly carried out by women, isn't seen as having an intrinsic economic value uh, within dominant economic uh, conceptualizations. And today, um, I believe, is the International Day for Unpaid Care, so very apt to mention. Um, but this undervaluation persists when domestic work is commodified through the provision of paid labor. Um, and in South Africa, there's a further layer, which is, uh, as indeed applies elsewhere, which is that the undervaluation of domestic work is very much linked to the profile um, of the workers themselves. Um, and the intersections of gender and race-based discrimination, um, which they are subject to, as well as um, other forms of discrimination, such as migrant status. Now, in practice, this has led to um, traditional domestic workers having very low and insecure wages. Now, in South Africa, there's a minimum wage for domestic work, but it's set below the wider national minimum wage. And the unions uh, in the country argue that this is completely insufficient to meet the cost of living. So it's really a perfect example of the undervaluation of domestic work and how that's manifested in poor working conditions um, in real life. Now, platform workers um, similarly had uh, low and um, unstable incomes. Um, I think what's quite important is that in some cases they earned more than the minimum wage, wage, but the earnings fell short of the amount needed for a family of four to exceed the poverty line. So we can see that this remains um, a core challenge at the heart of the emergent um, gig economy. Um, with regard to differences, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number that are outlined in our article, but I think one that I would draw attention to uh, today is what I could term the differences in institutional provisions um, across the two forms of organising domestic work. So South Africa's domestic regulatory framework is one of the most advanced in the world, which is very much thanks to the hard-won gains of domestic worker unions in the country, such as Satsawu. Um, and what this means is that domestic workers in the formal sector enjoy important protections, such as um, employer social security uh, contributions, sick leave, unfair dismissal rights, um, and workplace inspections. But the platform companies uh, classify workers as independent contractors, um, which means that they're not able to fully benefit from the rights and protections otherwise afforded to formal domestic workers in South Africa. Um, and I think relatedly, just a final point, yeah, relatedly, uh, collective action institutions are also different. So similarly to the traditional sector, many on-demand uh, domestic workers are isolated um, and effectively hidden behind closed doors uh, and now indeed hidden behind uh, platform apps, which has traditionally uh, made it hard to bring workers together. 
But while Sadsawi, for example, has a long history of organizing uh, traditional domestic workers, the prospects for organizing platform domestic, uh, domestic workers is less clear because there's currently no formal entity um, or collective bargaining mechanism, which is a real challenge to um, the pros their prospects of improving working conditions. In your article, you also analyze on-demand domestic work in terms of how it benefits companies, workers, and employers. Can you share briefly who are the winners and the losers uh, in uh, yeah, what you found in your research? Yeah, so I think there's some quite clear ways in which platform companies and the clients, uh, by which I mean the households that domestic workers are working in, are winners. So um, first off, platform companies. Um, I think the clearest point is that they win by positioning themselves not as employers, but as simply providers of technology, which brings together clients um, and the providers of domestic work services, the workers, of course. Um, and they are capturing value from workers' labours by charging commission on gigs, um, but at the same time circumventing the responsibility to uphold labour rights and contribute to social insurance on workers' behalf through this classification of workers as uh, independent contractors, which is indeed, you know, the, the basis of much of the litigation that's gone on in the wider um, gig economy, uh, which has been based on proving the existence of a relationship and not this classification of independent contractors, which the companies themselves um, maintain uh, is, is the uh, contractual relationship between themselves, the platform, uh, and the client and the worker. Um, for clients, um, it's interesting because the platform rates that they pay are clearly far higher than the government mandated minimum wage for domestic workers. Um, but the higher hourly cost to clients of hiring a platform worker, um, we identify as offset by lower transaction costs. So the high transaction costs that are normally associated with, uh, for example, selecting, screening, um, and supervising a worker that they would otherwise have to find uh, more independently. Um, and I think a critical point about clients is that they avoid the um, economic commitment of guaranteeing employment, uh, for example, for a set number of hours work. Um, and what many um, consider to be a very bureaucratic uh, process associated with being an employer um, as stipulated by South African labor law, which includes things um, such as having to provide a contract um, and employer contributions um, on the worker's behalf to the uh, unemployment um, insurance fund. So I think therefore it could be argued that from a client, client perspective, quite an important advantage of the platform model is that de facto, it provides a service that enables them to avoid compliance with uh, these labor or social security um, regulations. Now, coming on to the third um, group, the workers, of course. Now, the picture is, is slightly more complicated. Um, and I think it is critical to recall that the um, availability uh, and the quality of work available to marginalized women is uh, many times extremely limited in an economy characterized by widespread uh, un and underemployment and informality. Um, and indeed, the workers that we surveyed and spoke to were crystal clear. Um, economic need is the main motivation for them to engage in gig work. Um, many of them highlighted um, a, a lack of other options and reported that platform work offered some tangible benefits over both um, unemployment and the other forms of work uh, realistically available to them. So um, they reported uh, higher hourly earnings, uh, for example, um, some choice over work hours. Um, interestingly, overwhelmingly um, responded that gig work gave them greater freedom and control in their work. So 91% of our uh, respondents to our survey um, responded uh, in that way. Um, and also, for example, reported um, favorably about having an intermediary between um, them and clients. Um, and I think it's important also to note that the platform company that we spoke to was relatively, relatively, I say, good at providing uh, worker benefits. And this is corroborated, for example, by the University of Oxford in their Fair Work um, platform ratings. So, for example, this uh, the company um, whose workers we surveyed independently, for example, provide uh, private insurance to some workers. So, in other words, um, 
on-demand domestic work on this particular platform can be seen as a relatively better option for, for some workers. But, um, and it's a big, of course, a big but, um, there's still many workers who do less well on the platform. Um, they don't get as many hours of work, um, if any. Um, they don't have regular clients, and, and so they are not um, earning a decent income on the platform. Uh, and so by neither fully um, meeting workers' needs for a secure living wage, um, nor by operating to a model which fits within the formal framework of, of full protections, um, I think it can be argued that these platform companies are helping to maintain the traditionally inadequate working conditions that have long characterized domestic work. Um, I think as a, as a final point, just to, to, to directly um, come back to your, your question, Borislav, the, the regulatory framework is there for domestic work in, in South Africa. As I said, it's one of the most comprehensive um, in the world. But it's a lack of compliance, which means that much um, traditional domestic work remains informal um, and work is uh, operating in very poor conditions. But what distinguishes the gig economy is that lack of protection is built into the platform model by design. Um, and for as long as this is the case, um, I don't think the gig economy can ever be seen as a win-win option for all of those involved. One, one um, theme in several of the articles in the issue uh, is around the naming or labeling of things and the different policy and uh, practice practical responses to a particular label. So I want to turn to you now, Ella. Your Article analyzes the labels modern hero and modern slave in the way they are applied to Filipino migrant domestic workers in the UK and Lebanon. So please tell us about these two labels and their discursive role. Thank you um, and thanks um, to, add, to add my thanks um, to everyone else today for, for this opportunity to, to share the, the work that we've been doing. Um, so in the article, I'm, I'm interested in discussing these two terms, modern hero and modern slave, together, um, because I think that they operate discursively in quite similar ways to produce a, a binary and opposition that spectacularizes migrant domestic workers' experiences. Um, and in doing so, it then draws attention away from the everyday, as is the focus, of course, of this um, special issue. So modern sounds like a historical period, but I think in both of these terms does away with historical specificity. Um, to give you an example, we might think of former UK Prime Minister Theresa May's claim to eradicate the quote, barbaric evil of modern slavery, um, which kind of morally poses the UK in the image of 19th century slavery abolitionism even as May's own policies made life, of course, so much more difficult for migrants, um, including survivors of trafficking in the UK. Um, and obviously, I think that that contradiction is by no means a coincidence. Um, so while critiques of modern slavery, I think, are probably quite well known to many of today's um, attendants, as well as panelists, um, modern heroes is a translation of the Tagalog term Bagong Bayani, which was used um, by influential state actors in the Philippines and continues to be used today um, to venerate the sacrifices, the self-sacrifice that overseas workers make. Um, again, I think in this spectacular or essentializing rhetoric that masks the institutional nature um, of labor export in the Philippines and the everyday systemic exploitation that so many overseas workers face. Um, and I think to kind of refer to some very recent events and kind of update some of the material in the article. Um, we've seen uh, this week only that um, the Shura Council in Lebanon has blocked um, the implementation of a new um, unified contract um, that would include domestic workers in national labour laws and offer them those protections. Um, and so I think when we're not listening to domestic workers who are saying we are workers, domestic work is work, um, there's a kind of legitimation of their exclusion from, um, from labour frameworks of protection and legislation. Um, and so while I'm talking about kind of discourse and rhetoric here, the material effects are, are very, um, very apparent and very current. Thank you, Eva. Um, so I, I want you to tell us more about your 
uh, research, but first I, I know one of your research participants uh, is here with us in the panel. This is Mimi. Um, she's a Filipina domestic worker. So Mimi, thank you for being here with us. Um, and I, I want to ask you, can you share your perspective on how a label like modern slavery uh, affects the lives of domestic workers? Ayaga, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here in this uh, panel discussion. Um, yeah, uh, I am. Um, I've been a, a I'm a full time domestic worker, and I'm also been a victim of um, trafficking uh, of modern slavery. And uh, I can say that I am a survivor now because I already got my visa. But um, this modern slavery really affect the migrant domestic workers because domestic workers who are being uh, um, already um, proven victims of trafficking have been already in the slavery. And then they forced the migrant domestic workers to be in the system of um, the national referral mechanism, which they don't want to, because as I have said, uh, we are workers, domestic workers are workers, and that is what we want to be labeled. And um, we are we don't want to be labeled as victim, um, but they are forced us to be in the system where in, in the later on it became useless because we are not, it, it's, it's supposed to protect us migrant domestic workers, but it in the end, it's not really, maybe because, may, just like what happened to me that uh, when I was proven, when I got my visa, they only, after being for how many years of being undocumented, um, they only gave me two years of right to work. So I think it's very useless. This system is very useless for us. This is not, I, um, I, as, as I always say, this system, national, national referral mechanism is only for other victims of modern slavery, but not for us workers. Maybe it, it's only, it's only, um, uh, we can only, we want, we just want to be, to, to bring back the old system that we can reinstate, that they will allow us to reinstate our visa and not to be treated like a um, victim of modern slavery because we are not, we don't want to be labeled as victim or, or slaves. We, 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 we in, in a way, I can say that, okay, we are modern heroes because this is all like uh, being workers, being domestic workers is our, is our family's bread and butter. We also fight for, we also fight for a change. We, we fight something for a change here in United Kingdom. Thank, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Um, I don't know if someone from the UK government is listening to this webinar. I, Probably not, but I do hope they get uh, your message. I think it's a powerful message. We are not slaves, we are workers. Um, so to, to go back to you, um, Ella, I found your methodology uh, fascinating because it uh, quite literally captures the, uh, the voices of migrant domestic workers. So tell us about uh, your methodology in brief um, and your uh, larger research project. Sure. Um, firstly, just to add my thanks to Mimi for being here and yeah, for that very powerful message. Um, so the methodology of my project um, is based around sound walks, which is um, quite an established art genre, but kind of more rarely used in, um, in research, um, but involves working with a, a migrant domestic worker, Mimi being one of them, um, to record a conversation in a place that is important to them. Um, so that those places um, range from um, uh, Kensington Gardens in London, where um, a picnic happened that brought two um, networks of um, feminist migrant domestic worker um, activists together, um, all the way to a supermarket car park in Beirut, where um, one worker escaped from um, abusive employers. Um, and so we would go to that place together and record a conversation, just the audio um, conversation. And it would start with why, why this place? Why are we here? But then it's very much kind of led by um, the, the domestic worker participant. Um, and so there's a big kind of range in terms of what people decide to talk about. Sometimes it's not about domestic work or migration at all. Um, 
so it's very kind of it's very open-ended and led by them and then we work together to edit that recording into a shorter sound walk um so uh, Mimi I think spent more than 12 hours over several days sitting with me learning the sound editing software um and editing um editing that conversation so that she has the time um, to make really kind of considered decisions about how she wants to represent her perspective and what she wants to share with the listeners. Um, and then um, those sound walks are uploaded to the website, which I can just see you've shared in the chat. Thank you, homemakersounds.org. Um, and members of the public um, can download those sound walks. And the idea is that they can return to the places where they were recorded and go for a walk um, and listen to the voice of somebody who might have a completely different relationship to that space. Obviously, we're now kind of living in the age of um, various social distancing measures around the world, so that's not always possible. Um, but there are kind of alternative creative prompts like listen on an empty stomach, listen in isolation, that make those sound walks kind of inclusive and available around the world. Um, and I think what Bama was saying about her podcast is also really relevant to this project, that it's not just about kind of taking people's um, stories or messages or accounts and publishing those in an academic context it's really about creating something with people that is owned by them and it's in a public space that they can share with activist colleagues or friends or families or whoever um, and that belongs in the public realm not behind an academic paywall thank you Ella. um so we we have in the in the issue we have two articles um, whose authors couldn't join us. Um, I, so I will just say a, a couple of words about them. One is reflections from the field, disparate responses to labor exploitation is in post-Katrina, Louisiana. And the other one is ways of seeing policy paradigms and unfree labor in India. And as, as you can tell, um, uh, one is about uh, the US and the other one about India, but basically both articles argue that the exploitation of, uh, of workers can better be addressed uh, not through anti-trafficking or modern slavery focus or paradigm, uh, but through um, different approaches associated with workers' rights, really um, a remedy for workers as well as um, a measure that look at the intersect discriminations and um, uh, other uh, issues around workers such as caste or immigration status. Now I move to uh, to Ben Harkins. Um, ben, your, your article also argues for a shift in the response to the problem of exploitation of migrant workers. Can you explain why an expanded focus on wage theft could be more successful um, than limiting our attention to trafficking and modern slavery? Um, I think for any practitioner working on labor migration issues for an extended period of time, it's hard to miss the fact that the concepts of human trafficking and modern slavery don't speak very directly to the problems of most migrant workers. Their frameworks was focused explicitly on the most severe cases of exploitation. What I argue is that this emphasis leaves a major gap in terms of more mundane forms of abuse, which I refer to as the missing middle in the spectrum of migrant working conditions. What I try to point out in this article is that there are some fundamental problems with this disproportionate amount of attention being paid to extreme cases of abuse. The lack of clarity on what actually constitutes human trafficking or modern slavery continues to be a major obstacle to identification. Uh, in the real world, we know there's no clear divide between free and unfree labor, and trying to make a binary separation between the two often leads us down the rabbit hole. Another ob obstacle is that the concepts are really too abstract and severe for most survivors to self-identify abuses and that significantly limits uh, the agency of migrants themselves to voice grievances. I know uh, Joel had spoken to this earlier. Um, I also highlight that you know, framing, framing the issue of exploitation as resulting from criminality uh, 
really a convenient distraction from what is an immensely uneven distribution of, of global wealth. If we identify individual cases of severe exploitation as unacceptable, it really leaves the structural inequities um, questioned. I know, I know it, it may sound a bit overly specific to focus on wage theft, but there are some structural factors which make it a particularly common form of abuse for migrant workers. With globalization, we've seen the creation of business models which are heavily dependent on various forms of wage theft. And that's you know, both inside and outside of supply chains, where we see a key motivation for employing migrants is to keep labor costs low. Um, in addition, restrictive migration governance really ties migrants to their employers in many countries, which establishes a relationship of dependency. That decreases the ability of migrants to avoid uh, abusive situations, and it supports the defrauding of wages as really a standard function of these governance systems. Migrant workers are also more commonly employed in informal work, as it was raised earlier, uh, domestic work, and, and it's often not covered by labor and social protections. Uh, in particular, I think the global trend we're seeing towards increased outsourcing and misclassification of employment has led to a further decline in the labor rights that are provided. I think it is clear that increasing attention to wage theft on its own would not provide a comprehensive approach to all forms of exploitation of migrant workers. I think ideally it would be part of a broader shift towards a labor rights approach to these issues. But the empirical data available on exploitation of migrants does suggest that uh, improving the response to wage theft is a particularly pragmatic starting point. There's little doubt that it would enable a much greater number of migrants uh, to seek redress for the abuses that they face. When I was with the ILO, we set up uh, uh, migrant worker resource centers in Southeast Asian countries to increase access to justice for migrants and also provide them with other forms of assistance. When we started analyzing the data on the complaints that we received, what we found is that more than half of those cases were actually related to various forms of, of wage theft. And in addition, a substantial portion of those complaints showed indications of forced labor. What this suggested to us is that um, efforts to identify wage abuses are essential not only to remedy abuse themselves, but also to effectively address more severe cases of exploitation. Finally, I would just add that focusing on a more equitable distribution of wages would redirect attention to what really is a core issue at stake in the era of globalization. Efforts to address wage theft against migrant workers would contribute to an expansion of economic and social justice for a large segment of the world's most vulnerable workers. I think that's something that the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on counter trafficking initiatives every year has so far uh, been unable to achieve. You spoke about how wage theft interventions can be more successful. Can you give uh, one or two examples of such interventions just briefly? Sure. I mean, what I point out in my article is that unlike the enigmatic issue of human trafficking, really are proven approaches for addressing wage theft against migrant workers. We wouldn't have to rely as much on esoteric and untested responses. Instead, we would just focus on increasing the power of migrant workers within their employment relationships so that they are less dependent and can assert their rights. I think that one clear starting place is ensuring that effective preventative measures Against, against wage theft are enacted through labor protection laws. That means establishing robust wage protections that apply equally to migrants, such as fair and inclusive minimum wage setting, ad addressing discriminatory pay practices, adopting chain liability rules, and protecting workers from retaliatory dismissal. We would also need to couple those statutory protections with proactive and targeted labor inspections to ensure effective enforcement. The research on wage compliance 
has generally found that uh, employers decided on whether to follow wage regulations largely by balancing the expected costs of the mandated wage against those of non-compliance. Unfortunately, the, the likelihood of substantial financial penalties has steadily reduced in many countries due to, due to the heavily stretched staffing and resources of inspectorates. Labor organizing has also proven to be an effective strategy for responding to wage theft against migrant workers. Research in Australia, where underpayment of migrant wages is really a systemic problem, has pointed to the central importance of trade unions in providing migrants with access to redress. Uh, liberalizing labor migration governance regimes is another well-established measure for reducing the risk of wage theft. If we eliminate tied visas and work permits, we can provide uh, migrant workers with the opportunity to lodge grievances and freely pursue other employment when they're not properly paid for their work. Think of final key means for reducing wage abuses as ensuring that fair remedies are accessible in the form of recovery of unpaid wages and financial compensation. A significant part of the reason why many migrants are reluctant to participate in the criminal prosecution of trafficking cases is that they are time consuming, legalistic, and focus primarily on penal sanction of offenders. A lot of the research that's out there has shown that what migrants who experience abuse actually seek is financial remedies so that they can move on with their lives. One of the points you made about organizing, which um, leads me to Federico's article, um, and I will uh, move on to you, Federico, now. Your article uh, doesn't even mention human trafficking on modern slavery. It's only about workers' rights and the struggles and successes of waste pickers uh, in Colombia. So please tell us about uh, the struggles and success of uh, waste pickers in Colombia and how they achieve their successes. Well, first of all, uh, thanks to the journal, to the editors and to all of you to um, accept this article as a part of this issue. Uh, in fact, as, as Joe said, uh, my article does not talk about human trafficking or modern slavery. Uh, it's not about the worst cases, but I have to start and say that millions of waste pickers around the world suffer from modern forms of slavery and exploitation. Just to give you an example, in many garbage dumps around the world, waste pickers are exploited by those who control these dump sites private, public, or even criminal gang banks. My article deals with not these worst kind of cases, but uh, with a process of a structural transformation of uh, the condition of domination of this sector in Colombia. They used a lot of strategies to fight, to fight and fight uh, against overdetermination and this kind of position of subject that the economic system has assigned them. Uh, going, as the title says, for being considered trash or, or worse than that, disposable people, as they used to be called in my country, to being paid and recognized as the provider of the service of recycling. To all the audience, first, a waste speaker is a man or a woman who earns his daily living from the recovery of the waste produced in homes, institutions, industries. They collect materials like cardboard, paper, metals, plastic, glass, among others. And some of them work or collect these in the street or on the sidewalks. In other contexts, they recover these recyclables that are put in open dumps. And after this activity, they commercialize this recovered waste to reintroduce it into the value chain. It is estimated around the world that more than 20 million people survive thanks to this activity. And in all these contexts, they suffer discrimination by society and by the government. And you can imagine their work conditions are quite precarious. And despite this situation, his work provides important benefits to, the, to those societies. Some of them environmental, those related to the waste public management, some economics to the industry, uh, but the more important are the social benefits as, they, as they, they can be able to support their families thanks to this work in the scenarios of lack of employment opportunities, poverty and deregularization. In a way, waste pickers are the product of ages of everyday abuse in global economy. 
the Colombian case of my article exemplify a global trend to ensure the business of waste management, ignoring environmental and social externalities and ignoring other solutions related to consumption, circular economy, good practices, or even the integration of waste pickers. In my country since 90s, policies have privatized the service of waste collection, giving priority to private companies to collect and, and to develop these services. And they ignored the fact that for more than eight decades, poor sectors of my country, some of them displaced by violence, have been in charge of recovering this recycling waste. Public policies in this area reflect this linear and privatized model of waste management. And in order to guarantee the model, many of them began to hinder or even criminalize part of the world of the waste pickers. Just want to give you an idea of these policies. For example, in 23, national policy prohibited the use of car moves by horses without any alternative. In 2002, a policy established that waste pickers could only provide recycling service in small municipalities and lift the best of the recycling market to the hands of private companies. The same year, a national policy granted the ownership right of waste to the waste collection companies. And in this way, turning waste pickers into thieves. And in 2008, a national law established as undesirable and punishable practices, the three activities of the world of the waste pickers means recovery, collection and transport, commercialization of recyclables. The last uh, were the public tenders to choose private providers of the public service of collection and also the management of this landfill in Bogota in 2002, 2010 and 2011. And these uh, uh, public tenders were designed without integrated waste pickers. And against each of these policies, organized waste pickers led by the Association of Waste Pickers of Bogota carried out resistant actions that range from demonstration, public denunciation in media, but the more important legal actions to demand rights. And the latter had a huge effect in the Constitutional Court of Colombia, which through more than seven pronouncements in favor of the waste speaker, protect, for example, the right to work, the right to obtain a minimum detail, which is not the minimum wage, the right to remain and grow in the activity of recycling, and the most important, the right to receive a remuneration for the recycling service that they provide. And this last campaign can be translated into the statement that if there were no way speaker, it would be necessary to pay public or private companies to collect, transport, and dispose the recyclable waste. Therefore, waste pickers should be paid. And the municipal government in Bogota between uh, 2012 to 2015 developed the first remuneration system. In 2013, 14, and 15, national policies were created to establish how the recycling service will be remunerated, how it will be operated, how it will be regulated. A policy was created to formalize waste pickers. Thus, uh, by 2016, there was just one city where waste picker organizations were remunerated. And by 2019, there were 87 municipalities where there is at least one paid waste picker organization. As a result, more than 35% of waste pickers, uh, there are 60,000 in Colombia, receive, in addition to the payment to the commercial value of the recyclable waste uh, they recover, a monthly pay for collection, transportation, and recycling services. And that payment comes from the service fee paid by citizens. This is why many waste pickers call this second payment uh, the fee. But this scenario sadly is far from being for now a story with a happy ending. One had to accept that many waste pickers had doubled or multiplied by three its income. But the national government six, since 2016 has allowed waste collection companies and other non-waste pickers to enter into competition with waste picker and recycling service, largely because there is now a new incentive, as you can imagine, the fee. The decision by the national government to guarantee and protect this free competition principle ignores the preferential regime that the constitutional court created for waste pickers. On the other hand, there are a lot of uh, formalization requirements that are difficult to meet. There, many of them were designed for formal and not informal workers. And finally, successful uh, uh, formalization requires the participation of local authorities. And unfortunately, this has not been 
the case. Just to put in an example, the 40% of municipalities in Colombia does not have a census of way speakers. I think that this shows you uh, an idea of the process, uh, Boris Lab. Thank you, Federico. Um, so what can waste pickers and other uh, workers movements from other countries learn from Colombia? Uh, how can the successes of the Colombian waste pickers be replicated in other countries? Uh, I think that the first lesson is that there is a sustainable niche of integration for waste pickers. And that is the recognition and remuneration or compensation for being part of the public waste management system in any city in the world within which they are located. The second maybe is that there are alternatives to manage and gestion what we call public uh, services and goods. And this is linked to the figure of solidarity economy organization, such as cooperatives and association, which in addition to being redistributed in nature are labor intensive. And this is a key issue related to the neoliberal models. The third thing is that the introduction of a right or human rights perspective in our case, through the uh, legis uh, judicial power, uh, it's an effective way to counterbalance the abuse in and of the global economy, since it highlights the human and environmental scale rather than profit. And finally, uh, may you, may, many of you may know that there is an adoption of a recommendation 204 of the ILO on transition to the formal economy. And, and it's quite important from our perspective to set or to affirm as a lesson that formalize the labor is not the same thing that formalize the sector of worker in formal employment. A formalization should be constituting in special protection regimes appropriate for sector of informal workers. And if formalization is left to the labor market or to the market of value change of the activity that the workers carry out, exclusion will be even greater. I think that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Federico. Uh, so these were uh, the speakers who presented um, their articles. Now, apart from the seven research and conceptual articles uh, with, um, which the speakers now discussed and I mentioned too, we also published five pieces of um, what we call debate articles. These are short articles of around 1,500 words where authors defended or rejected the statement, it is worth undermining the anti-trafficking cause in order to more directly challenge the systems producing everyday abuses in the global economy. So Joe, I want to turn to you now. Can you please summarize uh, briefly uh, the five responses and what the arguments are? Um, it, it, it's a slightly challenging thing. So if, if you'll just kind of give me a little bit of indulgence, I just want to say something about how we set up this question. Um, because we're aware, like this question, so this is myself, Cameron and Caroline, we're aware that there's both opportunities and obstacles and tensions associated with the type of attention and funding and access, which tends to arise when you start talking and engaging around questions of modern slavery and human trafficking. And we know that that kind of access and attention and funding is much harder and more attenuated when you're working on other kinds of issues such as migrant and, and labor rights. So we wanted to have a question that foregrounded questions of tactics and strategy. So we, we invited people to think about whether the benefits of using these concepts and the access they generate provides more benefits than the potential trade-offs and complications that arise from using languages that invariably come with kind of very crude conceptual classifications, but also more generally come with problematic political agendas wherein anti-trafficking is often associated with, with the, the impulse to kind of like pr criminalize sex work or to build that ridiculous wall that, that Trump keeps talking about as an anti-trafficking measure. So this question was really about 
is it worth staying on the inside? Do the kinds of benefits that arise out of speaking and acting in anti-trafficking and anti-slavery spaces offset the kinds of problems and compromises that arise? And it's worth noting here that, that advocating for migrant worker rights, which I, I think I would regard as the, the alternative, and, and my colleagues have kind of articulate what that might look like, in lots of ways has been a losing political cause for the last 20 years. So we, we kind of understand that, that if, if you're struggling around unionization and organization, and you're struggling around, sorry, that's my dog, um, if you're struggling around mobilizing in defense of, of rights of movement and, and the protection of, of people who seek to cross borders, these things have, have, have not been easy political causes. So we, we want to understand and, and speak to the trade-offs that arise if, if you're kind of in the tent and the access that generates, or if you're on the outside and then finding it harder to articulate and defend another point of view. So that's the debate question. I think in lots of ways, I'm more interested in setting up the, the question because I'm not sure I can necessarily capture the nuances of, of everyone who contributed to this question's um, argument. So I'm just gonna very briefly summarize, but, but I'd hope that, that from that description, people will find that the question itself interesting enough to go and look at how a really great selection of contributors sought to answer it. So uh, in, in no way is this description exhaustive, but, but by way of kind of teaser or taster, I would note that we have five contributors. Um, we have three contributors who seek to make the case for working within anti-trafficking and anti-slavery frameworks in different ways. So we have Ella Cockbain who argues that there's no necessary incompatibility between anti-trafficking and, and uh, everyday abuse, but it's only some aspects of anti-trafficking that can be harnessed and redirected. And it's those elements that, that need to move from the margins to the mainstream. We have Sienna Baskin and Huey Hewitt, who are once again critical of a lot of aspects of anti-trafficking. The exceptionalization, this, this focusing on individualized narratives of, of kind of victims and villains. And as a consequence, they argue that there are alliances and forms of solidarity that can arise out of anti-trafficking, but ultimately anti-trafficking also needs substantial reform before it can do the types of things we might want it to hope for. And then we have Kate Roberts from, from Anti-Slavery International, who instead of thinking about how anti-trafficking might be reformed, instead argues that the, the only way in which you can address the systems which produce everyday abuse is by grounding them in anti-trafficking. And then finally, we have two contrarian positions. We have Alison Clancy and Francis Mahone from SWAN in Vancouver, Canada, who explain that they have decades of experience seeking to work within the anti-trafficking tent. And, and their, their arguments about protecting and advancing sex worker rights, they conclude, have not been able to shift the way in which people talk about anti-trafficking and how governments intervene in ways that are famously associated with collateral damages. So they instead conclude and make the case for stepping outside an anti-trafficking frame and they articulate and an, an outline an initiative that they're engaging with that, that focuses upon seeking a, a legal solution that will provide better protection for migrant sex workers. And then finally, we have Lisa Rende Taylor, um, who reflects on, on the experiences of Isara and her title 
is how we have to let go of the dream of prosecuting traffickers as the way of addressing the systems of exploitation which leave workers and migrants vulnerable. So I'm not going to pretend that's a complete description, but I'd hope that it is enough to invite everyone to, to go and have a look at the, the broader arguments and contributions that these five scholars and activists make. There is one question here for Federico. Um, the question is, since the decision in court recognizing the rights of waste speakers, have you seen these protection, protections extended to other informal workers? particularly those in migration, such as Venezuelan people, generating their income as rapid delivery drivers, etc. <clears throat> okay, I was just saying that unfortunately this is not the case. Uh, the first issue is the Constitutional Court has changed his judges and uh, some of them has a different orientation. And even if the Constitutional Court orders remain, there is a tension among the interpretation of this. And I have to say that private companies of waste collection has tried to make a sort of advocacy coalition to make us some influence in the way that these uh, judicial orders are materialized among, uh, through uh, public policies. And they try to introduce this uh, issue related to free competition and other, and other uh, Me measures that reflect its interest. In the case of Venezuelan people, you can imagine how hard things are. Many of them uh, find in the recycling activities, but also other informal works and alternatives. Some of them are moving through Colombia to return to Venezuela or are uh, trying to, to find some stable scenarios. So uh, the conditions from there are quite extreme. And the other issue is, as, as you can imagine, pandemia radicalized this kind of situation, this kind of, of, of pressure of, among the, the workers. Maybe this is a partial answer, but I think that, that uh, reflect what is happening in this scenario. We have some more questions. How do you believe civil and criminal law enforcement can work together better to address labor trafficking? And another one, with COVID impacting how the world communicates and relays information resources with one another, what sort of negative impacts has this had on migrant workers? I can speak to the, the civil and criminal legislation I know of. I think the first thing we've got to recognize is that Criminal justice measures have a really terrible track record. They have a really terrible track record in the sense that even on their own terms, the, 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 the numbers of prosecutions, despite best efforts, continue to remain really, really low. But I think more significantly, the criminal justice measures end up frequently hurting the people that they're supposed to help in terms of, of kind of deportation and lacks of adequate protection and, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I think there is a real kind of issue there that however much people want criminal justice to work, there's a real reluctance to acknowledge that in practical substantive terms, this has been something of a disaster. And, and I don't necessarily want to suggest here that it's entirely the fault of criminal, criminal justice mechanisms. I think in lots of ways, people are expecting things of criminal justice mechanisms they're not built for. And it's kind of an extension of this kind of over-policing dynamic where police increasingly intrude in all kinds of domains, do a really terrible job, and then consequently end up being a focal point for the, the fact that their remit and, the, and their actions just don't line up. So I, I would firstly suggest that there's not a seamless connection between criminal justice and, and other forms of intervention, because before we even get to that conversation, we have to first acknowledge that the track record of criminal justice really isn't good. And, and that's worth emphasizing, because I think there's a temptation to give criminal justice responses one more go and, and to once again seek to change their design, to, to change the protocols, to 
uh, tweak how and on what terms these interventions occur. And, and I, I worry that, that, that these types of conversations will be going for 20 years and people will say, keep saying, let's give criminal justice one more try. This time we'll get it right. At a certain point, you have to kind of acknowledge that this thing isn't working. And in lots of ways, I think criminal justice conversations and interventions need to shrink in terms of how much space they take up politically and institutionally. And in that shrinking, I would like to hope that you can have conversations about unionization and collective bargaining and effective regulation and the ridiculous kind of self-serving rhetoric associated with corporate social responsibility. And if you can kind of cut away the conversations which are dis placing a serious policy conversation. You can then have a talk about questions of migrant and labor rights in a way that cuts out the, the displacement effect that criminal justice kind of generates. So I don't really want a seamless integration between criminal justice and other interventions. My answer is more, can we just please shrink criminal justice and give space for other things? Another question, which is kind of related to this one, the question is, how could the problem of labor exploitation be diagnosed in another way than a criminal problem? And how could policies address it in an adequate manner? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, there's a, a very clear other way to diagnose um, labor exploitation outside of a criminal problem, and that's to diagnose it as a symptom of um, structural conditions of inequality and power differential. Um, which allow exploitation to take place um, you know and I think uh, as um, if I'm not wrong some of the articles in this series um, show and which Joel has just discussed um, criminal justice individualizes the problem um, and kind of puts an emphasis on this idea of bad guys you know exploiters or traffickers or whoever it is you know and if only we can tackle this handful of bad guys then surely, you know, through criminal mean, uh, criminal justice uh, processes and means, then surely that can eradicate the problem. Um, but the problem with that, uh, in my view, um, is that it takes the focus uh, away from um, these structural conditions of inequality and power differential. Um, and with that, um, quite conveniently takes away the responsibility, um, particularly of governments, to, uh, to deal with these underlying issues. Um, you know, saying the problem is not these, these big structural challenges, but, but individuals. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, we're short on time, but, but yes, absolutely, there's another, another way. Um, and, it, you know, I think um, by dodging, um, having to tackle some of these um, big structural questions, or indeed in the case of many governments actively um, supporting um, the maintenance of some of these structural inequalities um, through their economic approaches, um, you know, the, 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 the situation is continuing. So, you know, in terms of policy approaches, well, you know, there's any swathe of policy approaches, um, but I think it has to start with legislating for fairness um, and recognizing uh, inequality and thinking about what kind of policies will be needed to to tackle those? I was thinking maybe <clears throat> if all of you would like to to say a few final words um, uh, within one minute or so, um, either in relation to this particular question, you know, how to tackle labor exploitation, which is kind of the the overall. Um, of the issue yeah i just want to say that it's quite important uh to facilitate the voice uh, of the workers of the sectors in an organized way in terms of uh, reach some public agenda and uh, have a better understanding of this scenario not only for the those who take decisions but around the the entire society in terms to the challenge some hegemonic narratives around the, the issue, but the voice of the workers uh, are quite important on that. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to speak to the COVID question on uh, the impact it's had on migrants. I mean, I think there's already a huge information asymmetry um, between migrants and recruitment agencies and employers and, and migrants are always on the losing end of that. I think 
what has happened with COVID, at least you know where I work here in Southeast Asia, is that it's gotten considerably worse. Um, there's all these additional uh, safety protocols and procedures that migrants need to go through. They often don't know how much um, that will cost, how to complete the, the procedures involved. And yeah, I mean, that, that ends up um, placing migrants at a huge disadvantage. I think at the same time within our region here, you have a lot of migrants that are just desperate um, to get abroad again. They lived in communities where they had very little choice but to migrate. Uh, because there weren't enough uh, labor market opportunities where they were. Now they're in a position where, um, you know, the, the situation is even worse in many of those communities, and there are few, fewer opportunities to, to go abroad with legal status. So, yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's just made the, the situation um, more difficult for, for many migrants. Thanks. Parting thought on you know, these bigger questions that, that we've come to on uh, structures and what needs to change and, and want to point out that we have the most incredible capital concentration now in the digital sector that we've ever seen in corporate in terms of corporate you know, capital concentration and vast resources are being deployed to enable some of these firms to actually exit the stratosphere of rule of law altogether. I mean, really fundamentally, they're contesting whether they can be held accountable under national laws. And so when we come to the, you know, this, this whole question we've been coming to at the end of this, which is, do we just deal with the symptoms, right? The single individual cases, or do we deal with the structures? We need to keep that firmly in mind. We cannot ever, put out all the fires if we are allowing this, you know, sort of fundamental escape from rule of law. Yeah, perhaps just to bring a couple of the questions together, I think um, Abigail articulated really well um, some of the issues around, um, you know, she kind of brought, brought together the debate very well. And just to echo that, um, and then in relation to the COVID question, I think, um, and um, aside from the Homemakers Project, I've recently published a report about um, undocumented Filipi Filipino migrants in the UK um, <clears throat> who obviously have no recourse to public funds. Um, many of the kind of safety nets that are put in place in relation to COVID-19 are completely meaningless to them and they're not accessing healthcare at all. Um, and so I think that when it comes to addressing the inequalities um, that lead to exploitation, which Abigail has pointed towards, um, migration status and regularization, um, at least in the context that I'm working in, is, is really, really vital. And we have to think immigration and policy and, um, and labor exploitation always together. They're really impossible to, to, to extract, to bifurcate, um, especially I think when it comes to the situation now under the pandemic. Thanks. I want to thank you all for, for speaking at this event and to everyone who participated. Um, and yes, have a good day, good night, and good morning. Bye-bye. <laughs>